Ow! Werewolves of London. Ow! Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast, boys. Yes, that's what we're still calling this thing. Uh, I am Connor Nielsen, one of your hosts, and joining me, as always, is the Comics Kid 2099, where we talk about Twin Peaks related subjects. Basically, if it's got an actor or actress or creative individual who was involved in some way in the Twin Peaks franchise, we talk about it. Uh, today, uh, we are talking about The Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, first of all, Comic Skid, how are you doing? I didn't ask you that. I am doing uh, bloody all right, uh, to coin some uh, lingo from uh, Over the Pond. Uh, since we're talking about something from British pop culture, I'm doing, uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing good. <laughs> I got lost in my own bit there, but I'm, I'm doing A-OK. How are you doing? Oh, is Top of the Morning more of an Irish thing? I think so, but uh, it's, clo- okay. it's closer than anything we would say, I guess. <laughs> Okay, well, Ahoy Hoy? Oh, no, wait, no, that's Alexander Graham. Oh, I'm just I'm just the worst. I've watched so many James Bond movies, you'd think I'd be better at this. <laughs> but uh, we are talking about Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, specifically a Hallmark uh, Canadian television production of it from the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Comics Kid, why don't you explain to us the Hound of the Baskervilles? Well, it's a Sherlock Holmes thing, uh, possibly the most well-known Sherlock Holmes thing ever. Uh, I'm, I don't want to put all my money on that, but I would say if you found someone who's never read or watched Sherlock Holmes, if you ask them to name one Sherlock Holmes story, they might be able to name Hound of the Baskerville. Um, but, That's me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, and it stars Matt Frewer uh, as Sherlock Holmes. You might know him from Star Trek The Next Generation or Honey, I Blew Up the Kids, or no, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the, the better one. Uh, and it has Kenneth Welsh from Twin Peaks uh, as Dr. Watson. Uh, the only other actor I recognized was uh, Jason London, who uh, plays Sir Henry, and he is an American who has recently inherited an estate that has a uh, evil demon dog that uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, sends Watson to investigate, uh, and uh, Watson is there trying to kind of do some detecting on his own, and uh, that's basically the the elevator pitch for it. Um, Connor, you are not very familiar with Sherlock Holmes, is that correct? Correct. Uh, what did you think of the 2000 Hound of the Baskervilles? So the first thing I want to note, I have, I do not know who Matt Frewer is. Oh. Uh, I've heard the name, but I've not actually. This is the first time I've seen him in anything. He looks like if you took Kelsey Grammer and Peter Cushing and threw them in a blender. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I wasn't crazy about this. Oh. Um, more than anything, I was just kind of bored. Okay. Um, and I think that the best thing about this is Kenneth Welsh. And I thought it was awesome that he basically got to be the main character for an hour of this this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I think it's cool that you also know who Jason London is, because uh, I know him as who was effectively the main character of Dazed and Confused, uh, which is probably the most famous of Richard Linklater's films. He also made Boyhood and Before Sunrise and all those movies. Uh, but uh, Dazed and Confused is like he plays a. Uh, uh, Randall Pink Floyd in that movie, and uh, so this was kind of fun. Where it was a bit of like my two favorite, two of my favorite, two of my favorite filmmakers are David Lynch and Richard Linklater. So kind of seeing that crossover was kind of neat because uh, David Lynch did direct one episode of Twin Peaks that featured Wynda Merrill, which was the final episode. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, my least favorite thing about this though was Matt Frewer as Sherlock Holmes because I found him. Like, oh, like, I get that Sherlock Holmes is, like, kind of a douche. Mm-hmm. That's kind of his character. But, like, the only other Sherlock Holmes I'm familiar with is the Robert Downey Jr. movies, which I saw, like, ten years ago when they came out in theaters. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, those movies aren't great, but I, I kind of figured that for what they were going with, Robert Downey Jr. was, you know, he's kind of, like, a pompous, unlikable guy, but he's charming, so he's kind of, like, the likable jerk. Mm-hmm. Uh I just found uh, Matt Frewer to be really annoying, um, and it, it kind of just felt like a guy who really wants to be a star, who is mostly just kind of been a character actor, supporting actor type, and then now he gets to be the like, Sherlock Holmes, and he's just chewing scenery left, right, and center in a way that I found kind of obnoxious. Um, but more than anything, I just kind of thought the production was like, if I don't know, if this was like some high schoolers or some college students, and they had like access to a really big estate. And they just kind of like, let's make a Sherlock Holmes fan film. 
it'd be kind of cool, but it just sort of, I don't know. I got, I got really bored of this. So I don't know. It wasn't like terrible or anything. It's far from the worst thing we've watched on this. I watched for this podcast, but uh, far, far, I don't know. Far from the worst thing starring Kenneth Welsh that we have watched <laughs> for this podcast. I, I want to reissue my statement of apology <laughs> for having us watch Survival of the Dead. Uh, I want to rescind that I apology watched... because I, I quite enjoyed talking about that movie. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. Uh, but I will say I watched this for free with ads on, uh, on, on Amazon, and I will say that uh, – I'm kind of glad it had ads because they got to wake me up a little bit. So that was that was kind of neat. Uh, Comics Kid, it sounds like you maybe enjoyed this more than I did. What did you think of Hound of the Baskervilles? Okay. Well, first, I want to put a pin in what I thought, and I want to ask, is Jason London a good actor in Days and Confused? I mean, <laughs> how, do, how do I put this? Like, Days and Confused is awesome, and I love it. And it's like... It has, like, Ben Affleck and Parker Posey and Mia Jovovich and Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey and a bunch of actors who went on to be famous. And then it has all the main kids who never did anything else. Okay. Um, and, but what's interesting is that even all, like, all the performances are very naturalistic. If you're just watching people in their natural habitat, so it also doesn't even feel like you're watching people act. Mm -hmm. Or even if they're not good actors, it was, like... It feels like Richard Linklater just hung out with and just cast his friends and just told them to be themselves. That's what it feels like. So I don't feel like I can call anybody in Days and Confused like, oh, that's a good actor because the, I think the acting in a lot of ways is just so good that it's like it's so naturalistic that you're not even thinking about it as acting. Mm -hmm. So that sound it sounds like uh, then they made a good choice in casting Jason London for that because. I've only seen him in this, and there was a miniseries for Jason and the Argonauts around the same time, and he was Jason. And watching this and watching that relatively close together, I feel like he's giving the exact same performance. And I wouldn't open with that as my opening remarks if he's not, like, the second most important character in this movie. Um, and so I, he's not bad. I don't think he's a bad actor, but also I'm not getting anything. Like, I, I just am not seeing a whole lot of energy in his performance either. Um, so I, since you mentioned him, I was just curious if he was doing something different in something else. But uh, and it, it, he's still doing stuff today, so maybe he has grown as an actor. Because I, I want to say this is early in his acting career. Um, but I agree with most of what you said. Um, I am a, just a tiny bit more of a Holmes fan. I've never read any of the books, uh, but I have watched uh, a few episodes of. Uh, I was mistaken. Jason London was acting as early as '91, so this was almost a decade into his career. Um, I, 91 is Days and Confused, right? Uh, not, that was 93. Uh, I don't, uh, I just exited the tab, but uh, 93 was Days and Confused. So yeah, that was pretty early for him. Um, but yeah, I've never read any Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I watched a couple of seasons of the BBC series with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and uh, Martin Freeman. Uh, incidentally, in season two, they did an adaptation of The Hound of the Baskerville and then I watched the two Robert Downey Jr. movies. I thought the first one was pretty good. I liked it quite a bit. Uh, I did not care for Game of Shadows nearly as much. Um, so I like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I'm not just like a hardcore uh, Baker Street Irregular, as they might call the fans. But um, I agree with you that Matt Frewer is really hamming it up here. And his character is pretty awful. And I guess we should explain to anyone who hasn't seen the movie. But... Uh, Sherlock and Watson are hanging out at their house, and then someone comes and says, hey, uh, over at the Baskerville estate, there is a demon dog, and we want you to come and investigate it. And Sherlock basically says, no, I won't, but I'm going to send Watson over there. And so then, out of an hour and a half long movie, it's probably about uh, 20 minutes in that Sherlock and Watson part ways, and then you're not kidding, it's about an hour of the movie that we don't see Sherlock again. And then in the final, like, ten minutes of the movie, uh, the demon dog attacks Jason London's character, Sir Henry, and then Sherlock comes out of nowhere and shoots it. And he basically says he was hiding in disguise, and we did see this person that he was disguised as from a distance at one point in the movie. And basically he says, while Watson was kind of distracting everyone, that he was investigating incognito. And, like, everyone says, that was a horrible thing. You, you left, uh, you played with this guy's life. And, like, Watson's kind of yelling at him. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, this could have been good if we had, like, multiple Sherlock Holmes adventures with these guys. And we could have gotten to know them a little bit. Um, and there are actually four 
TV movies with these two as uh, Holmes and Watson. And I have one of them. I did not know that. Uh, so I actually borrowed my parents' copy of The Hound of the Baskerville. But un, uh, I did not know there's another one called The Case of the Whitechapel Vampire. Uh, I have that also. Uh, I have this little, uh, I bought it for a dollar. It was four vampire movies uh, in one set. Uh, I did not know that that was a Sherlock Holmes thing that was part of that set. Because uh, I was, before I picked this, I was kind of on the fence about if I should choose that or if I should choose this. Uh, so now that I know that it's a Sherlock Holmes thing, I may not choose it uh, with how little you enjoyed this. But um, I feel like if you had more time to get to know this version of Holmes, uh, and if you liked him a little more, like you said, Robert Downey Jr. is good at playing jerks who you still like despite themselves. Um, case in point, Iron Man started off as a very unlikable character, and then by the end of his first movie, you like him a little bit more. And if you could have gotten some of that with Matt Frewer, then I think you could have been able to forgive him a little bit for playing with the life of this one guy and basically like, oopsie, aren't I a rascal? I just, you know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I thought that was uh, – I, although I'm torn because I liked – that, like you said, that Dr. Watson is the main character. Um, once again, I, I think Kenneth Welsh is the best part of this movie. Um, I really enjoyed getting to see him uh, do stuff, and he gets to do some detecting of his own. Uh, usually when you put Watson next to Holmes, Watson kind of looks like an idiot. Uh, at the very beginning of this movie, Watson is giving his opinion on this cane that they found, and then Sherlock is like, oh, but you forgot one obvious thing, you uh, you foolish, foolish boy. And, like, Kenneth Welsh just kind of, like, sits down and is like, oh, okay, yeah. And, uh, if you've ever seen the BBC Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock series, there's a conversation here that almost happens verbatim in the BBC series uh, where uh, Holmes says, uh, not all people can be like superconductors, but some people can help conduct or something like that. Uh, and it's, it's a very similar conversation that happens in both of these. So <clears throat> I'm curious if that's actually in the book. But um, yeah, I agree with you that Matt Frewer is kind of hamming it up here. And I wonder if he kind of tones that down because I think this was the first of four that they did it was yeah it was it was the first okay one. so i'm curious if uh if he kind of reins it in a little bit in some of the later ones uh but also him being absent for two-thirds of the movie gives us some really good kenneth Welsh stuff that i really appreciated yeah i i i, I concur with the um kenneth welsh being the best thing about this and what i think it comes down to is that kenneth welsh is just a really good actor um kind of a kind of a bummer that he's Maybe it's not a bummer. I don't know. But he's just kind of in smaller productions as like a character actor. And I think probably what it comes down to is he just wants to live in Canada. He's a Canadian actor and he, just, he enjoys living in Canada. And uh, so people want to do stuff and he'll just be in it. But uh, he, he strikes me as – and I did not look this up. But he strikes me as a like a classically trained stage actor because there's just like certain elements of his cadence where when he's acting – he sort of embodies his characters uh, so wholly that feels almost like the way stage actors do. Um, where let's look at uh, like um, Wyndham Earl. Wyndham Earl's just nuts, right? Mm -hmm. He's basically like Charlie Day's dad or something. Like he's <laughs> crazy. Um, and then you have like the last one we watched was uh, <laughs> Survival of the Dead. And he's like, you know, kind of an Irish stereotype named Patrick O'Flynn. But uh, he... And he sounds like a leprechaun, but his whole kind of attitude is sort of this like kind of snarky kind of like, but he's still driven and, he, you know, to, to do a mission and he has like convictions, but he's also kind of a jokester at times. Uh, it does not at all feel like the same, like, it doesn't feel like that character has any of the same DNA of Wyndham Earl, uh -huh. though. And then you get this where he is very much Dr. Watson, a, you know, a man of the 1800s at this very reserved you know thoughtful um you know kind of uh, uh gentle man mm -hmm. uh, who of course is still uh you know on a case trying to figure things out you know and he gets a little intense at times but but it, it does not at all feel like the dna of this character resembles the dna of the other the two other characters that we've seen him play mm -hmm. um and so it's just one of those things where i really like him as an actor he's good at this his job and uh you know, I mean, I really like Kyle MacLachlan, for example. But Kyle MacLachlan tends to play a lot of similar roles. And you were talking about Jason London. Um, he kind of – you're right. Like, I know I've, this is the second thing I've seen him in. I've seen him in Days and Confused and this. You've seen him in Jason and the Argonauts and this. And he does very much feel very similar to Randall Floyd from Days and Confused. 
you know, in Dazed and Confused, he plays this character who's like on the football team and he also he also has like stoner friends. And so he kind of hangs out with the jocks and like the slacker stoners. And like the whole time he's kind of like jumping between a couple of like, because are you familiar with what Dazed and Confused is about at all? No, I know that Matthew McConaughey says, all right, all right, all right. And that's that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's also where he says, uh, you know, you smoke weed? No. Be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> And I, like, there's like three meme moments he has that like everyone memes now. And then of course there's the one where like that's what I like about high school girls. I get older, they stay the same age. <laughs> so he's so creepy in that movie. Um, but basically, what what Days and Confuses about is it's the last day of school in in this in this uh, Austin, Texas. I think it's Austin. And so it's like a very it's very much an ensemble movie, and it's just about a bunch of that you see about a bunch of different cliques, and. Uh, so there's not really a main character, but if there is a main character, then it is Randall Floyd. And if it's not him, then it's like this kid who's like just leaving eighth grade and is about to you know, start his summer before freshman year of high school. And, uh, you know, so they're kind of like the two emotional centers of the movie. Uh, so when you see him jumping between clicks, he's kind of like, like Jason London's character. When you see him jumping between clicks, it's kind of like a story means of bringing you to another perspective you know, that's happening in this mm-hmm. night. Um, and so, but he's kind of cool guy in the seventies. That's his character. And uh, I don't think he's bad in this movie, but he feels like he doesn't belong in this time. Like something about his attitude and his demeanor feels very 20th or 21st century to me anyways. And so when you see like Matt Frewer and uh, Dr. Mortimer and, you know, Kenneth Welsh, and you see, like, I think all of the actors feel like they're of their time when this takes place. And then Jason London, I get that he's, like, American, so he's kind of supposed to come in and feel, you know, culturally different than these other characters. But I think that at one point he says, like, oh, man, that's bunk. Like, that feels so 20th century. Like, it it, it really kind of stuck out to me. Uh, but I don't think he's bad. Um, I think he's just probably miscast. Yeah, and I... I'm not sure in the book if uh, if Sir Henry is from America, but that felt to me like we know that this guy cannot do an accent, so let's change it a little bit <laughs> and say that he's an American who's the last heir, and then he comes over from America. Like, that's what it feels like. Uh, and again, I haven't read the book, so I don't know, but uh, I know in the in the Benedict Cumberbatch one, it was a British guy who was the, the heir. But, um... Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah I okay. don't know, but... Um, that to me felt like okay let's bend the story slightly to match the capabilities of the actor and maybe that's for the best maybe we would have been laughing at it a little more if he was trying to do a british accent um i i don't know but um uh, yeah i i agree he's not a bad actor but and if he was playing like the servant i wouldn't have even questioned it um like i i think i would have just been like okay it's that one guy from jason and the argonauts but he is you know matt uh Sherlock Holmes is pr- not even in the top five most important characters in this. He's barely in it. So it's Dr. Watson yeah. and then Sir Henry is the next important one. And so, like, him being in the spotlight, especially after I saw the Jason and the Argonauts movie, I was kind of thinking, like, okay. Um, and if I hadn't seen Jason and the Argonauts, <laughs> I don't know if I would have I, – I would. I probably wouldn't have even thought about it. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that's fair. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that you're probably right, him being – Canadian is like a way of quickly, you know, writing around his uh, lack of an accent or his, you know, acting ability. Uh, I will say, though, that I actually kind of like that he was an outsider, Mm -hmm. uh, not just to the Baskerville estate, but also to London in general, because um, I don't know, there was like an element of like a like like a a ticking clock kind of. Where he, he kind of wants to get in and get out as fast as possible. It's not like an actual ticking clock, but just for him, he's like trying to get this over with. And uh, and I don't know. Like I think that this movie, like I think the best thing about this particular production from a story level is the whole are the notions of like tradition and family lineage, and sort of having him coming to London to the Baskerville estate and kind of realizing the extent of it. Uh, I think it's like the best part of like that kind of like connects to that theme. I think in a those, those themes in a in a way that I found to be the only real like thing that really clicked with me. So yeah, I kind of like that. Um, 
I, I, I guess I was a little distracted by that because, like, once the whole movie is over, um, spoilers for the movie, which we've already kind of danced around it, but uh, I guess the main guy is an illegitimate son or grandson of one of the previous Baskervilles, and the reason that he is trying to kill Sir Henry, played by Jason London, is once the last, le I guess the last, uh, see now, the last legitimate heir uh, is Sir Henry. And once he's out of the way, then this other guy can step up and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm an heir and I can inherit all this. Um, and at one point, uh, Sir Henry says, do you have any electricity here in the house? And he's like, no, your father uh, would, wouldn't allow it. And, like, they point to a portrait at one point, and it's dimly lit, and you don't see anything. And then late, at, towards the very end of the movie, Sherlock, like, takes a candle and holds it up to the portrait, and it looks exactly like the bad guy who is trying to send the hound to kill the guy. And I was thinking, oh, okay. Like, uh, and, like, thematically, you're right. Like, it is about, like, you know, Sir Henry comes here, and he's like, why, why don't we, uh, why don't we get some electricity here? And he's like, no, that's not how your father wanted it. And it's all about, like, you know, his ties to his family and, like, you know, this is how it's always been done thematically. But I was busy thinking about, like, okay, um, they were clearly just that that electricity thing is there so that we don't get to see the portrait. And then it's it's a way it's a way to <laughs> trick the audience. And I always hate it when mysteries try to trick the audience. I would rather a mystery be clumsy and the audience figure it out before the denouement than like basically not give us a way to figure it out. Like I had no idea who the bad guy was in this. There were a few different options, but I feel like they didn't give you enough clues to figure out who it was. They didn't really give you any clues because you don't find out that that guy is an illegitimate Baskerville until Sherlock has already or the the hound has drowned the guy. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, well, the part that I I liked is of him kind of reconnecting with his, you know, with like his uh, family's history is where they're talking about when they're like kind of walking around the estate and how like it's more than just the house. It's like almost the entire town around the house and like the farming community that comes along with it and and kind of how that farming community started off as slaves and and he kind of has like conflicting feelings about that and uh, you know because at the same time like right now all these farmers get to enjoy their income because like it you know they don't they're not industrialized yet like they're not using like farming machines but then like you kind of think about the reason they're even farmers to begin with is because they were slaves and like that's not good yeah. <laughs> right and so like it was just sort of an interest like and so like kind of him like there's not there's no discussions about this these are just things that are raised about the baskerville estate but they made me think about these things and i thought that was cool um, and then of course, like, yeah, the electricity thing, you're probably right. That's just there. So we don't show the portrait. Um, by the way, can we, can we talk about the, uh, this is just a quick, quick thing. Um, you're right. Like I, I also didn't guess what was happening. My guess was incorrect. My guess is the first thing we do is, Hmm, this guy left his walking stick. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. he did it. Whatever happens, it's, it's this doctor guy. He did it. He didn't. Yeah, he's barely uh, even in it. He, he's there to kind of get the case rolling. And then when Sir Henry and Watson arrive, he's like, well, peace. I'm, I'm heading back to my bed. See you guys. I'm out of the movie now. And then he, he introduces Watson to, uh, to, a, to a typist. Oh, yeah. And that's like, all right. Uh, he, he showed up to be like, uh, I got to introduce you to somebody to keep the ball rolling. All right, now I'm back. I, I, really, I really did uh, like this movie, but I am about to lay another one in it. Because um, Watson and Sir Henry have heard from the – from the servant that there was a letter that someone threw in the fire and it was uh, written by someone named LL. Uh, and I saw it before it disintegrated in the fire. And then the very next thing we see in the movie is Watson walking down the street. And then that guy with a cane, uh, he says, Hey, I'll, I'll take you on over. I'm going to, you know, I need to take something to this typist. And he says, uh, I'd like you to meet whatever her name is. It's like L Laurel Lynette or something. Uh, and it's, Lois yeah. Lane, that's her name, Lois yeah. Lane. And then Watson does kind of a, like, da, da, da. And it's like, <laughs> okay, we get it. We just saw the letter, or we just heard about it. Like, we know what you're doing. You're 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 telling us. And I, I wonder if this would have worked better if it was a little longer. Um, I feel like an hour and a half isn't quite long enough because you've got a, a decent-sized cast, and we don't meet most of them until almost half an hour in. That's true. I would not have wanted this to be longer because I was super bored. Um, so, 
Well, so hold on. Uh, something I, I was actually going to mention that I forgot a second ago was how well, let's talk about the backstory we're given about like the the folklore urban legend of the hellhound i'll need you to kind of lead on this because i was a little confused on this this legend that... and i'll tell you why you were confused because the audio mixing sucked <laughs> and I couldn't understand what they were saying my, <laughs> like, my dvd didn't have any subtitles at all i i usually don't really? like subtitles but occasionally if it's no offense to any of you across the pond, but if it's someone speaking the British language, I like to have some subtitles to kind of bolster the, the audio and I can understand what's going on. And I I was not able to do that at times. Yeah, so I, I guess I should tell you my experience. I was watching this last night, and then I fell asleep. <laughs> About like 10 minutes oh, into the no. movie. I was like, okay. Well, to be fair, the night before last, I got like four hours oh, yeah, of sleep. Okay. Like. I, I, I was already tired, um, and I, I was like, I, if Matt Frewer was like going on this big, long monologue, and I was like, I have no idea what he's even saying right now. Really hamming it up. He's getting all quiet, and then loud, and thus, and thus, and thus, and thus, and thus, and thus. It's like, oh my word, he's like Jim Carrey as a stage actor <laughs> or something. And then, and like, he's like, you know how like Jim Carrey's got like a rubber face yeah. comedy? This is like rubber voice <laughs> acting. It was like goofball. Like, this is ridiculous. To me it was. And then uh but then like we got to like the backstory and I'm like, what is happening? I like when I was watching it, I was confused because it seemed like, okay, there was this guy named Hugo Baskerville, and he was like a terrible yeah. person. And he was like, I want this girl. And then she was like, I am a religious type. I do not want to be with you. And he's like, oh, I don't care. And then, like, I guess they kidnapped her and then put her up to basically be a, like a, a, a sex slave or yeah. something. Like really kind of gross. And then like he went down and got drunk with his buddies and like went up to try to like go rape her. And then like she'd already escaped. And he's like, doggone it. I'm going to sell my soul to the devil if I can just touch that woman a little bit. And then I guess he just went off ahead of his men. And then his men were like, "Well, we want to see that," and so they hop on the on the the horses, and then they rode out and then found him dead. Okay, that's what happened. That that's that uh, they found him dead at the feet of a giant wolf or a hound with you know hell eyes okay. or whatever. I here's here's the thing though, it's so confusing and like like the 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 sounds of the flashback are like. Like like you know the the wine clanking and all the men yelling and like the horse galloping, the sounds of that like overpower the sound of the voiceover, uh, uh, like monologue that Doctor McKimbo, what's his name, uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Mortimer, uh, he he's he's like so that fine actor, but like he, he's like just kind of delivering a monologue like anybody would, but then like the the audio mixing the way the audio mixing kind of made me think of was like when I was watching it last night was so he got on his horses with a bunch of guys and then they rode out and they found her dead. Oh wait, it's not her. It's him. Wait, how did that happen? Like I got really confused because like I missed the detail about him going out ahead of his men. And then like his, his pals were all drunk and they're like, let's go see it. And then they followed him and then they found him dead. Yeah. I, I miss uh, the, I missed yeah. the part where it was connected to the to the dog. Like I I was all caught up with okay he's horrible he kidnaps her he wants to rape her but she escaped and then that after that I I kind of like wait what's going on next like I was confused uh, and again no subtitles on this DVD um, and so uh, that I, the whole time I was like I just assumed that like so, the bad guy just like created this myth about the dog like right now. I, I was a little lost on him connecting the, what he's doing now to something that happened like, you know, 100 years ago or whatever, or, or 20 years ago, whenever it was. Yeah. Well, no, that's – yeah, I, I can't blame you. I, I When I was watching it today, um, I was actually watching it uh, with subtitles because the Amazon thing allowed for subtitles. And then I was actually finally able to understand what was going on. Um and really, like, a lot of the first 25 minutes, I or not 25, but, like, I like to say the first 15, I needed subtitles because Matt Frewer's doing his rubber voice acting. And I was like, some of those lines of dialogue, I could not understand what he was saying. 
And uh, and so I was like, okay, I got it now. And I never watched anything with subtitles, so. I, I, I try yeah. to avoid it. I like being able to watch the acting and the expressions on faces and if there's words on the screen and I feel like that distracts me. It's why I've never seen Pan's Labyrinth. I know it's like the best movie ever made, but I, I, I don't watch foreign films. So I'm not racist. I just like being able to watch the acting on screen. But uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I get that. Um, and, and I will say that like I, I do watch quite a bit of foreign films um, and – I don't know what it is. Like, I guess I'm not opposed to subtitles, but like something about like watch just like psychologically, there's like something different to me than I can't understand what's being said. So I'm just going to read this movie versus like, okay, I know it's in a foreign language and I know I have to read the dialogue. And it's like, cause like, I feel like it's almost like there's, there's like a, like a, an order of operations to you as a viewer where it's like, if I can't understand what anybody's saying, I already, like try watching it. I will just go back and I will not even like be watching the movie because I feel like just knowing what's happening is more important. And I will get that through like reading the dialogue so I know what the dialogue is. Um, but for whatever reason, like like for example, Parasite is awesome. But you know what's also cool about it? The language that the actors use. I, maybe it's not even the actors. Maybe it's just like when they were translating the subtitles, what they understood was that people read with short one syllable words or simple words, very commonly used words. And so like the subtitles for uh, parasite, you can read them very fast. And uh, so I feel like I can just kind of like look down and like my eyes glide across the, the subtitles and I can like get my eyes back to the image very quickly. So, okay. Yeah. Um, a uh, quick note about this movie. Uh, the uh, servant, his name is John Barrymore, uh, not to be confused with two members of the Barrymore acting dynasty. Um, I believe I believe Drew <laughs> Barrymore's father and either – or maybe her grandfather and great-grandfather were both named John Barrymore. Uh, so when he introduces himself, I immediately thought – and I don't even – the only Barrymore I'm really familiar with is Drew, but I was aware there was a John Barrymore. And the – the first one was actually also uh, he acted in some of the very early Sherlock Holmes movies, uh, like back in the like wow. early 30s. Uh, so I wonder if I, I'm looking at the Wikipedia for the novel of uh, the Hound of the Baskerville. I'm not seeing anything about uh, the servant's first name, so I'm curious if they named him John as like a uh, a little nod to actor John Barrymore. Oh, that would be cool. Um... Because I know, like, in the credits, he's just listed as Barry Okay. Okay. Um, and also, that actor, uh, he plays uh, the voice of Mr. Ratburn in the animated series Arthur. I don't know if you ever watched that when you were a kid. Oh, yes. really? <laughs> I just found that out looking at looking him up. Uh, I didn't recognize his voice. Um, he's, he's pretty good at doing uh, American Mr. Ratburn and uh, not American John Barrymore. But uh, I don't know if he's always been Mr. Ratburn or if he's, like, taken over the role. Um He's credited in 156 episodes, so that's uh, that's quite a bit. Um, but yeah, um, where where uh, do you want to take us in a direction here? Yeah, I, I'll say that. So part of me wants to like critique some of the production, but I can go two ways here. I'll go with with the uh, with some of the acting choices. I feel like a lot of like the the suspects are told to really lay it on thick and project a lot of like not like project their voice but like project intent for example like barrymore the butler oh my word it's like oh no i wouldn't do that if i were you and then like the camera pushes in on him and he's got these big eyes and i'm like maybe i'm supposed to be suspicious of him or or you'll have uh uh, like the 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 neighbor with the big mutton chops, you know the guy who turns out mm-hmm. to be it. He's like, "Oh, hello! I know all about these marshes." Mm-hmm. And then you hear like a low hum, and you're supposed to be like, "Ooh, maybe he's a suspect too." <laughs> and so it's like there's a lot of that in the acting, and and I found that a little um, frustrating. Um, I don't like being like told what to think because I feel like that's the quickest way for me to like dispel any suspects, mm-hmm. which is because they're laying it on thick with everybody. That's why I was convinced it was Dr. Mortimer who was mm-hmm. the bad guy. Yeah. 
Um, I, I'm not uh, very smart when it comes to mysteries. Very rarely can, can neither, I neither. Uh, like, oh, that's who it is. But it's also, I, I, so this is going to be like hypocritical coming from me, but like there's a very specific way to write mysteries. Um, and this movie, it's not the worst I've ever seen, but it could have been better. Like you said, it, it's really trying to make you think it's these other people so that you don't think you know because at the very close to the beginning when watson is at the mansion he sees uh mr barrymore with a candle at the window and he's doing something and then it's like oh what's he uh what's he doing he, he's suspicious and then like you know like you said it, it tries to kind of keep you and, and that's a red herring you know mysteries do that but then yeah, also classic red what? Is it, oh yeah, yeah classic red herring. Uh, but also when you're doing a red herring, you also need to throw in actual clues. And I don't think this movie did enough of that. Um, and I wouldn't be able to write a mystery to save my life. Uh, it would be, I, w I would be clumsy and it would just fall apart when you looked at it. But like looking at this mystery, like, I, and it, maybe it's harder. I, I'm really kind of curious how this holds up compared to other Hound of the Baskervilles productions, because like, I, I remembered watching one. It might have been with Jeremy Brett. He was a pretty famous Sherlock Holmes in like the 80s. Uh, and uh, it, I remembered very specifically um, that his boot was stolen. And so I knew whoever stole the boot was using it to try and get the dog to smell the scent. Um, and I did not know who it was, but I knew someone stole the boot. And he mentions that here. Uh, and then, like, did the movie ever explain why this particular dog has red eyes? No. Well, they said it was it was bred and blinded. Okay. That, that's I don't think that's good enough. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like <laughs> no, it could be both. That, that that's the explanation. They they said it was okay. blinded. And it was bred to, to for its scent to be its highest sense. And I think that's supposed to explain the red eyes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh. Is it weird that the Benedict Cumberbatch version that has a secret government installation doing uh, secret experimentation on creatures that that feels more plausible than this? <laughs> like I don't know. Like the 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 one that's with Benedict. I don't know if you're familiar, but basically the whole premise is it's Sherlock Holmes, but it's set in the present day, and like Sherlock Holmes as a pop cultural icon does not exist. So it's like let's take the Hound of Baskerville and try and do it as a modern day thing, um, and so it's going to be different than this, but like. Uh, also, that was, I think, an hour and a half long episode, and I just, I feel like they were able to kind of work the mystery a little bit better in the same amount of time than this was. Yeah, so, so you and I, we both love us some Knives yep. Out, right? Um, I, I would say that was the last mystery I watched, but I have seen Mulholland Drive now, which is a David Lynch movie. Um, Mulholland Drive is a mystery, that is like a legit fair play mystery. Everything has a place in that movie, but it doesn't tell you anything like in dialogue. Um, I don't know why I said that, but this is a Twin Peaks adjacent show and that's a Twin Peaks adjacent movie because it was made by David Lynch and Robert Forster's in it and stuff. But um, anyways, uh, but with Knives Out, remember how like the first like 30 minutes of that is like uh, Benoit Blanc and the uh, the cops are – re-interviewing and re-interrogating yeah. the family of uh, yeah, the Thromby family. What's cool about that is like, you don't see like, it's not like they're all kind of scattered around the house. And then you have Benoit Blanc just kind of walking over to one person, talking to them for a little bit and then walking oh, across the yard to talk to another person and then walking up the stairs. And then like, that takes up an hour of the movie. That's what happens in this episode. I feel like so much, like I like Kenneth Welsh a lot, but I got really bored because a large percentage of this is just walking around. Okay, now we've met everybody. Now I'm going to go across and talk to all these characters again, but this time we're going to gonna try to see if there's any clues we can get out of it. And it, it, it's so slow moving in how it like gives its information that I'm honestly surprised it was able to make it to an hour and a half. Like It felt, it felt like it was kind of running too long for the kind of uh, – um, for how much story I felt like it yeah. had. Yeah, and, like, maybe that's why, like, with something like, uh, a lot of mysteries will do a closed room mystery, where it's like, something happened, and it's, you know, it's someone in this house. So, like, let's lock all the doors, no one's allowed to leave, and we're gonna figure this out, and then, you know, the cops are on their way, or whatever. Uh, Clue, the movie Clue, one of my yeah. favorite movies. Uh, it's not a fair, 
Hateful Eight? Yeah, yeah. Hateful Eight is a great example. Uh, and you're able to spend time with these characters and figure stuff out along with the characters who are also trying to figure out. I won't say Clue is a fair play mystery, since it has three possible endings, and if you're watching just one of the endings, then there's a good chance some of the clues in the movie lead to one of the other endings. So it's not necessarily something that works as a mystery, but still... In some ways, it works better than this, because like you said, you're spending a lot of time, like, Dr. Watson has to go and meet the typist, and then he has to go and talk to the guy who's spying on his neighbor, and then you find out, oh, the maid, uh, she, her brother uh, has been framed for murder, and he's trying to escape to Australia, and so that's a whole thing that we're having to deal with, and it's just stuff that's happening until we get to what's basically a pretty simple story of this illegitimate heir who's got a dog that he's trying to train to kill the legitimate heir. And that is a story that could have happened in like half an hour, but there's all this other stuff that they're trying to distract us with. And I, I think it could have, uh, I would have been fine with it changing stuff from the novel, since I haven't read the novel, I really would have been fine with that, changing stuff so that it works a little better uh, in the context of you know an hour and a half. Uh, yeah. And I feel like, like the stuff with like the, the guy with the, uh, with the, not magnifying glass, but the telescope. He, um, I feel like that is just there to like seed Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how he's been around. And like, honestly, when it kind of came down to like that whole extra curl of Sherlock being around, like once he showed up, it was like the denouement where he's like explaining everything. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> like, I, I was able to kind of put it together already, mm -hmm. you know? And so when he's just kind of going on and on, and really all he's doing that is explaining how he fits into the equation. Um, and at that point, I was like, I'm I, sure, I believe you. Can this be mm -hmm. over now? Like, I, 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 yeah, I was kind of just really ready for it to be over. Um, but I also feel like it kind of leaves things on the table. Uh, you know, Sir Henry is the co-lead of this, and by the end of it, does he go back to, does he go back to Canada at the end? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, like the uh, the woman who, throughout the whole movie, we were told she is sister of the guy who did it, and then it's like Sherlock says your husband, and I was thinking, how did you find that out? Like, you know, if this was Robert Downey Jr., you'd have some little thing where it's like, well, as you see, uh, her finger is slightly. There's a tan line on her finger where she took off her wedding ring. And it's like something like that. And it's like, okay, I buy it. You're the smartest man in the world and you saw some clue. But this Sherlock, he just says, your husband. And everyone says, what? And she says, yeah, he made me pretend to be his sister to so that I could, I don't know, so that she could, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> like she says it. Well, no, it was very obvious to me. He, they wanted their kink to be like a thing that everyone else was in on. So. <laughs> they wanted it to be like a, a, in a, what what's that movie that Guillermo del Toro did that uh yeah, <laughs> they, they're, they're into that kind of stuff yeah um they, they were like we love that episode or the that that story arc in Twin Peaks <laughs> where <laughs> oh um, um, we we um, you're gonna be the cougar lady and you're gonna seduce James uh, our role play is now gonna be our public persona and that's just how it's gonna be <laughs> so um. No, it was kind of weird. And it was like, that was honestly like one of the more predictable elements of the story. Like I didn't, I, I mean, I didn't see them being the bad guys, but I also didn't really see anybody being the bad guys because there was like a lack of momentum I felt that was building. Like, oh, each step brings us closer to the truth. It was just kind of like, yep, there's a thing we're supposed to be solving. So, oh, so, that's a piece of information. Yeah. Oh, did, okay. Yeah. Business as usual. Did, did the woman, did she go to jail at the end? Like, I was confused, because you said it leaves stuff on the table. And, like, does he go, does uh, Jason go back to Canada, or, or go back to America? We don't know. And, like, I was, I kind of thought they were setting up, like, a, oh, now her husband's dead, so she and Sir Henry are going to get together. Is she? That, that's what I was thinking, it, it, too. But, like, because when uh, Watson and Holmes leave, he, uh, Sherlock says, like, uh, ma'am, and he, like, takes her arm, and I was like, where are you going? Like, is she going to jail? I, I don't know, because, like, she was kind of in on it, but also she did try to warn uh, Sir Henry. So, like, I was, like you said, it leaves stuff on the table, and it's like, oh, we've o we've only got ten seconds left. We better wrap this up quick. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it had all the real estate it needed, but it misused it. Um, I guess I, I want to complain a little bit about the uh, the production um, this feels like, like economy filmmaking. <laughs> like, like it, we, we got, we got, we got two locations and, and we got 
a week to film this. And so like, don't like just show up, know your lines. We'll figure out what we're doing like the day of. So like early on, I kind of cut onto this where like the shot setups are very traditional. It's fine. It's a TV production, but then like my mind started going to like places that I don't usually think about when I'm watching a movie. Like if I'm thinking about the blocking of a scene, you're not doing your job right. Um, like, like, uh, are you familiar with that term? Because I, there's a few yeah, people I, I, I kind of like you know putting someone like mm-hmm. you, you stand here, the camera's going to be at this angle, that kind of. Yeah, yeah. So it's like early on when uh, Sherlock Holmes is explaining how like all the stuff about Doctor Mortimer just based off of his walking stick. He's just like standing by the window, walks up, you know, paces over to Doctor Watson, turns around, walks back over to the window stops turns around walks back over to dr watson stops turns around walks i'm like I'm like that's the blocking of this scene you have a whole room to work with and you're just like you know what i mean like like it was it was stuff like that that i felt like i usually don't think about those things and then like when when it's uh when they're talking to people a lot of the times it's just like like a lot of the exposition and like kind of talking about the 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 estate it's just uh uh not John London, what's his name? Jason London and Kenneth Welsh. And they're just like walking. And then eventually, you know, occasionally let's stop and we'll face each other and we'll keep talking. <laughs> then we'll keep, it feels like a Star Wars prequel. You know, like, like, like in terms of, okay, sitting down, having a conversation. Somebody stands up and they'll walk and turn towards the window and they'll stop and then turn around and keep, it's like, it, it, it feels like it was shot as economic as possible. And I understand that it's a TV production. I get it. But these kinds of little details are like the subconscious. Like, like they, these are the little details that make something feel boring. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's, it, it's made like with as like, like it, it's, they're not, it's not being made because like we want to make a Hound of the Baskervilles thing. It's like, okay, we need to make a Hound of the Baskervilles thing and we got a week to shoot it. Just like get it done as fast as possible. And when you're getting something done as fast as possible, like obviously if you're under a deadline, that can lead to a lot of like creative triumphs. It can also lead to kind of cutting corners in like in those same creative fields. Yeah, um, blocking should be like sound design, where if you are, yes if, yes that's if a great analogy. About yeah. it, then they're doing it wrong. They shouldn't. You shouldn't be distracted. Like sound sound design most of the time for me is like I don't even like it doesn't register for me. But like and and I wasn't really thinking about the blocking. But now that you mention it, I'm thinking about the movie. And I'm like, yeah, why did they do that? Like. Um, you know what they could have done like at one point watson is complaining about sherlock smoking so much and so like instead of him just walking to the window walking back to the chair walking to the window again you could have had him like he reaches for his pipe and then he's about to light it but it's like oh i don't have any tobacco so then he walks over to the dresser and he gets some tobacco and puts it in and then he's like oh i left the the match over there at the chair so then he goes back to the chair you you all yeah, you always want yeah. characters to be doing something. You don't want to just have someone sitting in a chair and then Watson sitting in a chair and it's like, here's a shot of Holmes, here's a shot of Watson, back to Holmes, back to. You want them to do something to kind of like keep it keep a little bit of momentum, even if the story isn't moving quite yet. You want something to be happening, and this is uh, n- not a whole lot is happening. Yeah, like do you remember uh, Watchmen chapter two? There's that part where, you know, Lori is visiting her mom while Dr. Manhattan and, and everyone else goes to the comedian's funeral. And, uh, you know, Lori starts smoking and then Sally gets up and starts opening all the windows mm-hmm. as like a passive aggressive way of like telling her to stop smoking in, indoors. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe have Dr. Watson kind of start doing that. Start opening up some windows and then, then uh, you know, Sherlock could be like, oh, I'm fine. We'll go outside. Yeah. Instead, it's like the three people sitting down, <laughs> like three stuffy British guys sitting in chairs talking. And it's like, OK, this is yeah. it. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. Uh, there's and like I said, this isn't something I really thought about when I was watching the movie. But then when you brought it up, it's like, oh, wow, that it was kind of bad, like in a couple of those scenes. Um, and that's not something you should ever the audience should ever be thinking about. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, do you ever listen to Red Letter Media's commentary tracks that they do every once in a while? I've listened to one of them, one or two. Um, okay. 
there's actually a funny bit where they start talking about that, where they're talking of the, the, the commentary they're doing is a nightmare on Elm street. And there's a scene where Johnny Depp and uh, Heather Langenkamp are like talking and it's like, they're in a park, but like the park has like a Creek going through it. So they're on a bridge in a park. And like, so they're standing at the bridge and then you have Johnny Depp's just, like eating fast food on like the railing of the bridge. Like, like it's a wooden bridge. So it's like, the railings aren't like little like thin railings. They're kind of like, you know, put your you can put your hands yeah. on them and stuff. And then like Mike's like, why is he eating fast food in this location? Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like a funny detail. And then you know Jay's like, hey, you know, it's it's something for him to do. <laughs> and so I just thought that was a, that's where my mind went to. Um, so is there any place you wanted to take this conversation? Ah, uh, no, not really. Um, I I think the bad guy he uh, in his face. I know it's not him, but. He reminded me, have you ever seen the CW TV series Lucifer? I have okay, not. Are you aware of the actor who plays Lucifer? Okay. I'm aware of him, I thought yeah. this guy looked a little bit like him, and I knew it wasn't him, because this was a good little bit before that guy became famous, But and his hair is different, but his face reminded me so much of that actor. Like I was like, is this someone I know? And I looked, and I didn't recognize him, but he in his face especially when he gets mad at uh sir henry at one point i was like is this lucifer like did he get like you know a, a wig or something like um but yeah i thought he looked kind of like uh that guy uh whose name i do not remember tom ellis maybe um i uh i don't have anything else about other than like you know mr ratburn and uh jason and the argonauts um Let's see. I'm probably I'm gonna. You, that, that that bad guy, he he looked like somebody, but I could not put my finger on it. Um, he also I I think I already had um, I had uh, what's his name who played Professor Quirrell in a uh, Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone. I had him on my mind because he played Watson in another version of this story. So I kept thinking like oh. maybe it's that guy, and it's like no, that's not him. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, like I said, I have a. Uh, a copy of the Whitechapel Vampire, and uh, I was I kind of had that uh, in the back of my mind as like something I could possibly choose because Kenneth Welsh is also in that. Since we were so kind of lukewarm on this one, I'm probably gonna just watch that on my own, and then if I feel like it's a significant improvement, I may choose that one in the future and see if if that one holds right. up. But I uh, now that we've seen this, uh, and I didn't even know it was a Sherlock Holmes thing until today. Um, but now that we've seen this, I'm like, okay, I may just you know, check that one out, go on a solo adventure, and see if that holds up. Yeah. Yeah. It can be like a, you know, how, you know, in the book house boys in Twin Peaks, you know, one of them might go on their own little adventure. You can be a podcast <laughs> boy off on your own, your own little adventure with that. Um, it, was it one of those things where you were just like, we're looking at the back of that box and going, hey, this also has Matt Frewer and Kenneth Welsh. What a coincidence. Uh, I knew that Kenneth Welsh was in it. I think uh, I bought that DVD like sight unseen. I hadn't seen any of those, but it's like this is a dollar for four vampire movies, even if they're hot garbage. Like I'll probably get some laughs out of it. And then I was going through Kenneth Welsh's uh, career whenever we did the uh, uh, Survival of the Dead, and I saw that that title, and I thought, wait a minute, I recognize that title. And so I had that in the back of my mind, but I did not know that Matt Frewer. I I only saw that that was a Sherlock Holmes thing today after I watched this. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, was there anything else you wanted to say about this movie? Um, I did not like the music okay. at all. It sounded like, like stock stock mm-hmm. music, uh, and whenever it cuts to like that creepy like dun 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 the music, it made me roll my eyes. That's about it. That that's all I got. Um, well, I'm sorry you didn't like this one. Uh, it's one of those things I enjoyed it. I think mostly because of Kenneth Welsh, and if it was anyone else. I probably would not have enjoyed it as much, but I enjoyed it at the time. And then as you talked about it, I was like, yeah, I, gr- I do agree with a lot of what you're saying. So um, I, I don't think either of us would recommend this movie. Um, what uh, what do you have for us to talk about in a couple weeks? Well, boy, oh boy, was this an emotional roller coaster. Interesting what to pick. Last time I picked a uh, an Academy Award winning romance film that uh featured two actors from twin peaks and i was thinking why don't i choose another academy award-winning romance featuring two actors from twin peaks which is also on the afi's top 100 list you know titanic and then i thought 
<laughs> no, because I found actually a TV show that was a very fascinating pick. And I was for sure going to pick that. But then, I'll save that oh. one for later. But then, Joel Schumacher died. Yeah, couple. And I think it's actually cool that you brought up vampire movies, because I've never seen The Lost Boys. Oh. Um, and I know that you've seen yes. it, have you? and now I'm trying to remember who the... Kiefer Sutherland oh, yes. is Sam Stanley in uh, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. Uh, I think he's one of the only actors who's only in Fire Walk yep. With Me. And so um, he's Sam Stanley, and I know that he's in The Lost Boys. Now, I know that you've seen this movie. Rasco, our colleague, is a gigantic fan of this movie. Um, and my uh, my stepmother, this uh, Lost Boys might be her favorite film. So Lost Boys is one of those movies I've been needing to watch forever. And, uh, you know, Joel Schumacher, he had his he had a very long, illustrious career, had his highs, had his lows. And I figured I'd probably I wanted to watch his most beloved movie. Um, and it's kind of a shame I have to wait till he died to do it. But uh, this one's for you, Joel. Interesting. Um, I I have seen this movie. It's been a few years. I had forgotten that uh, I had forgotten about the Keeper Sutherland uh, connection uh, because he was only in Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me. I tend to forget that he was that that yeah, he's a connection yeah. that we can use. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, and I thought it would also kind of be neat. I'm trying to go to some picks that we've never done before, and uh, never done the Keeper Sutherland uh, connection yeah, before. So that's yeah. good because uh, it opens things wide up. Um, I'm always trying to. I'm always trying to pick something interesting that's like different, uh, but sometimes it's you know even though Twin Peaks there's a you know plethora of actors like you know especially with the Twin Peaks the Return that really opened things up for us. Um, it's still sometimes you can accidentally like pick someone that you've already picked for, but this is good. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, for anyone interested, it is on Prime Video. Uh, you can rent it for four dollars. Uh, I. Not to not to show my hand, but I do think it's worth it. So uh, if you want to watch along with us and then you can hear us talk about it in a couple of weeks, that'll be something you can do. And I'm going to see if I can get Rao on this okay. podcast. Yeah. And, uh, it was years since we've talked yeah, with him I, uh, in, in I this format. I want to say I haven't talked to him. It was either Alien Covenant or War of the Planet of the Apes was the last time I spoke to him. Mm -hmm. That's like three years yeah. ago, yeah. It's been a while. Um, so yeah, that'd be good. Um, if if you can if you can do it. Um, if he's if he's up for it, uh, I'm I'm down for that. If he if he's down. Yeah, I know he's very uh, you know sheepish about being on camera and you know or even having his voice on camera. He's he's very sheepish about that these days. But uh, you know, let's let's see if let's see if I can okay. convince him because I know he does really like yeah, this movie. Cool. Well then, uh, we will uh, be back in a couple weeks to talk about the Lost Boys. Uh, in the meantime, I am the Comics Kid 2099. And I'm Connor Nielsen. And we will be back soon. Bye. Howoo! Werewolves of London. Howoo!